Awesome. All right, guys. Well, is this too loud? Is this okay? You, you think it's okay? <laughs> All right. Um, well, it's really wonderful to uh, be here. Um, I always love coming to the to the GGI. It's a wonderful place. Uh, <clears throat> and I hope you guys have been having a blast at uh, what looks like it's been a terrific school so far. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, a topic that uh, my friends and I have been working on for around 10 years now. Uh, it's been developing from a number of points of view. Um, and uh, it has, I think, reached a sufficient level of uh, sort of simplicity and generality uh, as well as sort of proximity to really things that describe the real world around us, wor world out there, uh, that I think um, uh, it is uh, appropriate to talk about at, uh, at, an, uh, at, a, at a school for PhD students uh, like this. I actually gave a, a first course on the subject while I was uh, visiting Harvard on sabbatical <laughs> last semester. All the videos for the lectures are online. If, if people are interested in, in getting into this in even more detail, um, uh, there's a whole semester's course, essentially. Actually, uh, the, 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 the semester's course is literally going to be on topics that I will not be talking about at this school. <laughs> um, uh, I'll be talking about even more elementary and sort of basic things, that, which are somewhat more recent, actually. Um, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, I, uh, you will understand what the title means as, the, um, as, the, uh, uh, as this lecture uh, progresses. Um, one of the motivations for this entire subject has been uh, thinking about the many magical, mysterious, sort of remarkable properties of good old-fashioned particle scattering amplitudes. And particle scattering amplitudes are important to fundamental physics. They're, of course, important to particle physics because they're the, thank you, sir, uh, because they're the basic observable of our experimental friends. That's how we learn about uh, high energy physics by colliding elementary particles. Um, you know, a few particles go in, lots of particles come out, and uh, that's how we probe uh, high energy physics. And <clears throat> the sort of earliest indication that something remarkable was going on was that, uh, in principle, there's nothing new in this. If you're just looking at standard model backgrounds, if you want to calculate uh, you know, glue, glue to glue, glue, uh, glue on, glue on scattering. Um, that two to two process is something you put on a problem set in a first year quantum field theory course and you use it to decide whether to take someone as a grad student or not, if they can do it, right, you know. Um, but people, for practical purposes at the LHC, need things up to, I don't know, something like two in and eight out by now. And certainly already 30 years ago, it was clear that it had drawn colliders because it's, you know, alpha QCD is not that small, it's about a tenth. That, uh, and we're interested in lots of relatively rare processes that you'd need to know two in, three out, two in, four out. And already two in, three out is something that you'd only put on a problem set to badly torture somebody. Um, because if you just uh, do the Feynman rules, it's quickly like 50 horrible pages of algebra with no clue that there's anything interesting going on in the answer. Two to four, I don't know, 500 pages of algebra if you write big like I do, okay? Um, with no clue of any structure or simplicity in the answer whatsoever. Now, you might naively think the answer looks complicated because it is complicated. No one promised you a rose garden. Um, you know, you're asking a pretty complicated question. Two gluons in. After all, the normal way of thinking about these processes in quantum field theory make two things manifest. They make locality of interactions in space-time manifest and they make quantum mechanics manifest. And that's why Feynman is justly famous, right? Because Feynman's way of thinking about these things made those two principles of 20th century physics as manifest as possible. Okay, we draw all these pictures representing every way the interactions could have taken place in space and time. That's locality, right? The, the interactions, just have particles meeting at a point. And we're supposed to sum up every way things would have happened in order to get the, uh, the final answer. That's a pathological picture, and that's in order to enforce unitarity. So we want to make space-time, the principles of space-time and quantum mechanics, locality and unitarity slightly more technically manifest. That's called Feynman diagrams, right? Good. And so if the answer looks complicated, surely it's because it is complicated, right? And part of the chauvinism of fundamental physics is to declare as interesting only those questions that have sufficiently simple answers as, and to declare as engineering everything else, right? 
Uh, so this looks like a classic engineering problem. Oh, someone's got to compute two to three, two to four, too bad, the experimentalists need the answer. Some schmo has got to go do the computation, right? Of course, uh, physics also has a, a wonderful way of rewarding morally correct behavior. <laughs> okay? And so the people who had to do this calculation uh, 30 years ago, a little over 30 years ago, discovered something amazing that the first, uh, there's a remarkable series of papers by Steve Park and Tom Taylor. Um, they first discovered that the you know, 500 pages of algebra actually using every trick they knew in the book could be simplified to 10 pages. So 500 to 10 was a big, was a big deal. And then they discovered that the final answer could actually be written in one term, a single term, the famous Park-Taylor formula. Um, uh, for particular helicity configurations of gluons. Okay, so if the two of the gluons have negative helicity and the rest have positive helicity, there's this one line, one term answer. In fact, if all the gluons have positive helicity, the answer is zero. If all but one have uh, positive helicity, the answer is zero. So it's the leading interesting answer where two have negative helicity, everyone has positive helicity. This is even just a tree level. Okay, so, all right, so. Back then, this was not universally recognized as the tip of a giant iceberg. Today, we know it's the tip of a very giant iceberg. But um, already, it's an indication that there is something funny with the usual way of doing things. It's not wrong. Of course, it's completely correct. We make quantum mechanics and space-time as manifest as possible. It's correct. And yet, it's clearly hiding something. For example, nowhere in the structure of the answer when you compute with Feynman diagrams, do you see that there's any difference between whether all the polarizations are plus or some are plus and some are minus and so on? Yet the final answer sensibly depends on that. Now, why is that? That's because in the usual way of thinking about uh, particle scattering, in fact, in the usual way of thinking about field theory, built into its very name, the notion of fields are primary. And what's the telltale sign that you're dealing with fields? Certain words make an appearance in your language, like polarization vector. Okay? After all, we're scattering particles. The particles aren't Lorentz, don't carry Lorentz indices. Particles have a spin or a helicity. Um, uh, uh, scattering amplitudes have an interesting transformation property under the Lorentz group. When you do a Lorentz transformation on momenta, they're not Lorentz tensors. They pick up the action of Wigner's little group on the, on, the, on the helicities if they're massless, or an SU2 rotation if they're massive, okay? Now, all of that is shoved in to the choice of polarization vector, and uh, so you have one object you compute with Feynman diagrams, right? This is Feynman tensor, and then you're supposed to contract into polarization vectors. What is that doing? That's taking the external fields and putting them on shell to turn them into particles. Those polarization vectors are like putting the external fields on the equation of motion to uh, t tell us about the uh, particle scattering. Well, the particles are the things that are actually real. They're the things that go click, click, click in the experimentalist uh, detector. All the rest of this stuff is a construct that we put in in order to make locality and unitarity as manifest as possible. Okay? And especially when you have particles, massless particles with spin, this comes at a tremendous cost. We have all this gauge redundancy in our description of the physics. If you give me a polarization vector for a massless spin one particle, it's not a unique object. Okay? If you say, uh, you know, if I give you a polarization vector for a particle moving in the z direction, you might say, look, I know what the polarization vector is. It looks like that. I'm very smart. I even know there's a plus or minus i over root 2 and everything for a positive and negative helicity polarization. And yet, this is not actually a 4 vector. If you do a Lorentz transformation, these zeros, see, the, 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 uh, this is the momentum of the particle, right? These zeros are meaningless. Okay. If I do a Lorentz transformation, I can do a Lorentz transformation or a sequence of Lorentz transformations that keeps the momentum fixed but changes those zeros to something of the form A. Okay. Nothing stops me, in other words, from taking the polarization vector and adding to it anything times the momentum of the particle itself. And you see, this is completely compatible with the condition that epsilon dot p is zero because p squared equals zero. So this is one of the very, very basic indications that there's something wrong because we don't get to unambiguously associate a polarization vector with a given helicity particle. We only get to associate this whole equivalence class of polarization vectors 
Um, and that's why we need lots of gauge redundancy in order to describe the physics of massless particles of spin one, and the even bigger diffeomorphism redundancy to describe the, the dynamics of massless particles of spin two. And the word redundancy is there to remind you that it's in your head as the theorist. This is a consequence of the formalism that you're using to describe the physics and not a property of the physics itself. And that's in large part responsible for the explosion of complexity when you start doing even tree-level calculations in Yang-Mills theory. Okay, so all of this is to say I could spend hours and hours talking about this, so I'm, I'm, I don't want to spend a lot of time on, on uh, philosophy uh, in the beginning of this lecture. We can talk about it at great length over lunch and dinner in the next uh, couple of days. Um, but I want to just say that uh, uh, in practical calculations for yang mill scattering amplitudes, things relevant for hadron colliders, which is where these things began, it's an interesting playground because both the strengths and weaknesses of the standard formalism are manifest. Okay? So locality and unitarity are in your face at the expense of all this gauge redundancy, which leads you to suspect the final answer is hundreds of pages of algebra, and yet we find out that the final answer actually in sometimes is a single line. More complicated cases, a little bit more complicated, but always is vastly simpler than anyone uh, expected. And in the last 10, 12, 15 years, we actually see more than that it's simple. The final answer, even in good old fashioned Yang Mills theory, has hidden infinite dimensional symmetries that are invisible term by term in the Feynman diagrams, that are just a property of the final answer. Okay? So, um, okay, so that's some indication that there's something wrong with the usual way of doing things. It's totally correct, but maybe there's some way of thinking about the physics where these hidden symmetries, the simplicity, and other structures are made more obvious, um, and something has got to give. The thing that's got to give uh, is surely that somehow the principles of space-time and quantum mechanics should not be as in your face, as, as, uh, as manifest as they are in the usual picture. All right, so that's a very practical indication that there is something funny going on, that there's something interesting going on. Just lots of magic in the structure of amplitudes that needs to be exposed and understood. And we're seeing it in more and more places. In fact, um, where it's been seen uh, on steroids is in the context of Yang-Mills amplitudes or their close cousins at loop level, maximally supersymmetric um, uh, amplitudes in N equals four super Yang-Mills. In the planar limit, that's where the most magic and the most uh, understanding is. This is a toy model, but I emphasize this is a toy model that a leading order of approximation is the same as the scattering of gluons in the LHC at the real world in the high energy limit, right? So as toy models go, it's not so far from the real world. You know, it's like not even a spherical cow. It's like, you know, kind of a cow that can see some ears, maybe a spot, <laughs> okay? Um, Okay, so, uh, but I'm not going to be talking about it in these lectures because we're going to be talking about something even more basic and even more surprising in some ways because we can't even lay the blame or the credit for the magic on the presence or absence of gauge redundancy in our description of the physics or the presence or absence of supersymmetry. We're going to be talking about boring old phi cube theory. <laughs> We're actually going to be talk, talking about something that, in a sense, contains the most universal aspect of scattering amplitudes for any theory in any number of dimensions. And even there, we're going to be seeing magical hidden symmetries, hidden structures and properties that are going to be manifest from a different point of view. Okay? So if, you, if you're scared of polarization vectors and gluons and, and uh, helicities and supersymmetry, we're just going to be doing good old-fashioned phi cube theory in the, uh, in the amplitudes part of this uh, of these uh, lectures. Okay, but, um, but let me just quickly say a second indication that there should be some way of thinking about uh, scattering amplitudes in a new way. I started off with a very practical one, but there's a, there's a sort of different philosophical one, which, is, uh, which goes back to what's important about scattering amplitudes, not just practically to the life of the particle physicist, but conceptually. Uh, to anyone who cares about uh, 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 observables when you have quantum mechanics and gravity. So famously, when you have quantum mechanics and gravity, you don't have any observables in the interior of the space-time. Um, uh, so if you try to measure anything 
inside, if you're trying to measure anything in quantum mechanics, you have to do the experiment infinitely often, and you have to do it with an infinitely heavy measuring, with an infinitely large measuring apparatus. Otherwise, the measuring apparatus itself has quantum mechanical fluctuations that uh, give you some irreducible systematic error to the thing that you're trying to compute. In a world without gravity, there's no difficulty doing both of those things. In a world with gravity, there is, because everything gravitates. And, and I can't do a measurement in this fixed room with an apparatus that gets bigger and bigger and bigger, because it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And before it gets infinitely big, it collapses the whole room into a black hole. It gets heavier, then I can't do the experiment over and over again, because I get sucked into the singularity and I die. Right? So that, that's very important. It, it, that, practically speaking, this is irrelevant. Uh, in any practical sense, because the, the, the limitation to the accuracy that we're talking about is super exponentially small. But just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, let's say I, me, I want to uh, measure the g minus 2 of the electron to the, to, wait for it, 10 to the power of 10 to the 40 decimal places. Okay, let's get that again. 10 to the 10 to the 40 decimal places. Okay? Now, I have an army of graduate students, food, everything I need, right? But I, I'm, I'm going to try to—I'm I'm, going to try to do it, me. And I can't. It doesn't make any sense for me to talk about anything with accuracy one part in ten to the ten to the forty. In fact, I can't talk about anything with accuracy better than one part in ten to the ten to the thirty, because I'm made of ten to the thirty things. And that means that by the time I do the ten to the ten to the thirtieth measurement, I may have fluctuated into a cloud of dust. Too bad for me, right? One of the more mild things that could have happened is my brain could have fluctuated quantum mechanically. And even though I should have written down 7 for the 10 to the 10 to the 30th decimal place, I wrote down 2 instead. Okay? You see, any finite object, it's a simple but deep point that any finite quantum mechanical object has a finite resolution to anything it can talk about of order e to the number of the uh, components that it's made of. Okay? And that's why if you want to make perfect perfectly precise measurements, and these perfectly precise measurements are supposed to be the outputs of some putative theory, right? We should know what, what's in principle precise to talk about so we can have a theory to talk about it. Well, such a theory um, uh, cannot talk about anything with perfect precision unless you can make the number of degrees of freedom of the apparatus arbitrarily large. And we're restricted to do that if we attempt to do the experiments in a fixed size room. Okay? This is the deep reason why gravity is holographic that we cannot talk about observables in any precise way in the interior of space-time. What we can do is take our apparatuses, make them bigger and bigger, and shunt them off to infinity. And then we can go to infinity, they can fire particles in from infinity, they can bang into each other, they can go back out to infinity where they're measured, and those observables that start and end at infinity are the things that at least are the obvious Quantum mechanical observables you're allowed to talk about when you have quantum mechanics and gravity. Okay, so now this is a very basic fact. Uh, various people like Bryce DeWitt and Roger Penrose, a little more implicitly, actually already appreciated this in the 1960s. Gravity is holographic in this sense. The observables are not associated with the interior of space and time. They're associated with uh, measurements that can be done at infinity. And of course, once you have this idea that the, that the measurements can take place at infinity, uh, start and end at infinity, you wonder whether there's a theory that can live at infinity that can just compute them. So, so where the interior of the space-time is like a hologram. Now, of course, we all famously know how this works in the context of gauge gravity duality. Okay, so where, uh, where this is the closest we can come to a universe in a box. If we have a universe in an empty to sitter box, it's a box in the sense that, that, uh, that the proper distance from a point on the boundary, uh, from a point in the interior to the boundary is infinity, but it takes light a finite amount of time to uh, bounce off the walls of the box. Okay, and this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, um, but uh, one thing that it manifestly is, is a duality between two systems that otherwise have ordinary physical words describing them. Okay, so in particular, uh, it's, an, it's, an, it's an example of emergent space But not emergent space-time. The time that flows on the boundary is the same as the time that flows in the interior. Okay. And once you're very non-trivially in this holographic frame of mind, you say, look, the observables only live at infinity. 
So let me go to infinity and see what it looks like there. Well, when I go to empty this inner space, and I look at the boundary, it looks like a normal place. It looks like flat space in one lower dimension. It has a normal notion of, it has a metric. It has a no, normal notion of locality. It has a normal notion of time. And so if you want to have a theory that lives there, there is a reasonable thing to do. Put an ordinary quantum field theory there. Okay, and there's still an enormous amount we don't understand about how this works, but we're not, we don't have to like start from scratch to figure out what we're even talking about, what the words are, what the grammar is, what the language is. The time that flows on the boundary is the same as the time that flows in the Balkan. We have two ordinary quantum mechanical systems that are dual to each other. Even the word duality it says that there are two things that are equivalent. Now, one of them, the boundary description, we can in principle give rigorously. And so we think of that as giving a definition of what we mean by time evolution uh, and so on in the bulk. But the point remains that these are, these are systems where they're both ordinary physical words uh, describing what they're supposed to be. Now, this is not the real world. And as we try to get closer to the real world, one step closer to the real world is flat space. The world isn't flat space either. The world is cosmological. Okay, but one step closer is flat space. If you haven't seen these Penrose diagrams, we're not going to really uh, uh, use them. Um, but uh, but, in, but uh, I really want to emphasize uh, a difference here. So, so when we talk about flat space, um, we put in an in state, something happens, and we get an out state. And so the boundary observable in a flat space time is the scattering matrix. Okay, so they're the, they're the scattering amplitudes. So that's what's interesting about them. Uh, uh, what's, what's cool about amplitudes is they're both practically significant for particle physics experiments, and they're also the boundary observable, this formal boundary observable in asymptotically flat space time when you have quantum mechanics and gravity. You're not allowed to talk about anything else in asymptotically flat space time, at least quantum mechanically, uh, uh, in, an, in, a, in, an, in an obvious way other than the uh, S matrix. Okay, but now you see that the life is, uh, let's say you want to take this holographic mindset, just like we had here, and try to say, look, this is the, the experiment starts at ends in the boundaries of Minkowski space, so let's put a theory that lives in the boundary of Minkowski space. Now life is much more confusing. Okay, there are lots of ways of thinking about what this boundary is. Um, for example, the most obvious thing that you might think the boundary is is just look to see what you see around you. Right? If I look around, what do I see? I see the celestial sphere that surrounds me. Okay, so I, I point in every direction, okay, and, and every light beam hits the celestial sphere in some spot. So that's what geometrically, the most obvious boundary of Minkowski space is the celestial sphere, uh, and um, also with a time variable that sort of labels when you decided to shoot your laser beam in a given direction. I can decide to shoot it one second later. It lights up the same point on the celestial sphere, but one second later. Okay, so that's a three-dimensional boundary of four-dimensional Minkowski space. Very good. What the hell are you supposed to do there? Nobody knows. Okay, it's, it's actually, I mean, it's a fascinating research program that uh, Andy Strominger and, and, and many of his friends have been studying actively over the last five years. Um, uh, there's a lot of beautiful kinematical things to say on the celestial sphere, but nobody knows what the rules of dynamics should be. Why not? Because there's no obvious notion of locality on the celestial sphere. Okay, it's this fucking unit sphere. What are you supposed to do there? Right? It's clear. Um, the particles go in, bloop, and they go out. They're light in, light in here, they light up out there. There's no notion of close or far. You know, it seems, seems to affect each other uh, in, an, in an arbitrarily interesting way, with no obvious notion of locality and no particularly useful notion of time. Okay, so that's one kind of geometric boundary, but it's not obvious what to do there. And there are many, many others. Essentially, every way of labeling the kinematic data of particle scattering is in one way or another giving us the variables that the amplitudes depend on. Whether you think about them geometrically, more or less geometrically, is sort of a technicality, and it does not matter. We, we really have a canvas. The sort of canvas is what the amplitudes actually depend on. Just like in anti decitter space, what the boundary correlators actually depend on are points on the boundary. Okay, and so then you can ask, I can, can I give you functions of points on the boundary that have various consistency conditions, like 
like the correct short distance singularities, operator product expansion, and so on. Okay? We don't have the analog of that in flat space in any one of the ways of uh, thinking about what they are. So here's our canvas. Okay, our canvas is some kind of kinematical space for the, for the particle scattering. So here's many ways of labeling it. Maybe it's a celestial sphere. That's the most geometrical one. Maybe it's just n null momenta. Let's say I'm scattering massless particles. I have n p1 mu up to pn mu. Maybe it's Mandelstam invariants, pi dot pj. Maybe there are other variables, like twister variables, which are, you know, they're, doesn't really matter. Twister, momentum twister variables, and so on. These are all ways of labeling the on-shell kinematics, the things that the amplitudes actually depend on. Okay? The amplitudes don't know. Again, the experiment starts and ends at infinity. They don't know the gluons went in and one hit the other and then this happened and that happened. And the sum. All they know is some things went in from infinity, they went out from infinity. The data, for example, for each massless particle is a three vector, not a four vector, right? I just give you the direction it's going in and the energy is specified by the on-shell condition. Okay, so, but this shows you the sort of magnitude of the challenge. In this space, Somehow, we have to find a question. We have to find a question to ask in this space whose answer is the scattering amplitude. Right? We have to f somehow, I mean, the analog of what we did in the ADS is that we go up there, the boundary is a nice normal place, there's a normal notion of time, locality, etc., and there we ask a question about the correlation functions of a quantum field theory. Okay? This space, we don't know what to do. What do I do if you give me n null momenta? What the hell question do I ask in the space of n null momenta or n momentum twisters or Mandelstam invariants and so on? Okay. So this is a more adventurous business. Okay. Um, but I've now stressed the second, uh, the second indication that there's something going on. The first indication was a very practical thing. There was some magic in the structure of amplitudes. We should understand where they come from. Secondly, we have these sort of deep indications that we should learn to think about gravity. We should learn to think about any, all of physics in this way that doesn't make heavy use of these sort of redundant things that we don't see. From the, uh, if you think about amplitudes, all of the interior of the space-time, for that matter, all of the evolution in Hilbert space is all redundant stuff in the end just to get this giant matrix, S. Okay? And so we want to learn to ask in this space what kind of question is there, or we're supposed to ask here, that's going to spit out an amplitude? And what we've been seeing, so in the past sort of 10 years, we're seeing more and more examples of what's going on in here. And that's what I want to give you a very practical introduction to in the rest of these, and at least part of the rest of these lectures. Um, but what we've been seeing is there's some question we ask in this space whose answer gives us local and unitary scattering amplitudes. In other words, it's really the principles of locality and of unitarity, space-time and quantum mechanics in concrete examples that we see emerge from something else. And the something else is much less familiar. Uh, it has to be much less familiar. That's the, the entire point. We don't know what to do here, so we've got to find some other kind of uh, question to ask here. And the kind of ideas that are showing up involve notions that are combinatorial, that are intimately connected with a notion of what are called positive geometries, and their associated differential forms. I'll describe, I'll explain what all of these things mean in these uh, lectures. But just, uh, just to, just to uh, give you a, a rough idea, in this kinematical space, we're going to find some interesting geometric structures, okay? living in kinematical space. And the amplitudes are going to end up being certain functions, or really more precisely, differential forms, that have the properties that have singularities on the boundaries of these geometries. And they're entirely determined by the requirement of having singularities on the boundaries of these geometries. And there's a lot more to say about this. This is no, nowhere near done. It's a big work in progress. So I'm only going to tell you sort of some aspect of things that we understand in the simplest, in the simplest uh, possible examples. 
Um, now that's the story for amplitudes. When we go to cosmology, what Guy has been talking about in his lectures, things are even more confusing still. Because now, what are the boundary observables? All you get to measure in cosmology, you lie on your back and you measure correlations in space. That's it. There's no time variable. There's no t in any measurement you make. Okay. What is cosmological time? It's a story that we tell, that we introduce in order to give a rational accounting for patterns that you see in space. Now, that's what every historical science does. A paleontologist inferred the existence of dinosaurs because it explains patterns of bones in the ground today. Right? There are big bones with little bones inside them because there was a big dinosaur that ate a little dinosaur. Okay? Um, that's a story we tell about the past. Or a detective says that person A murdered person B yesterday to explain the pattern in space today that the bullet from the gun belonging to person A is found in the body of person B. Okay? That's a pattern in space today that we infer a history to explain. But there's no time variable t in the measurement. Okay? And so that's what we're talking about, right? So we get these correlations in cosmology. Where do they come from? Right? Well, of course, we normally say there's some cosmological history that gives rise to them, but the purpose of this way of, 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 of thinking is to find a different question purely living on the spatial boundary where the where the measurements are made to give you the same answer. Actually, Guy's lectures are a very practical beginning to actually taking this point of view and making it calculationally useful. So, so uh, he won't be stressing the, the, uh, the uh, uh, well, you'll actually be seeing that uh, this, this, this point of view actually useful in his, uh, in his uh, lectures. Okay, so I, I'll, I won't be saying anything about cosmology, um, uh, other than to say that, uh, other than to say that the same kind of question is there and is there even more uh, acutely in cosmology as it is, so uh, as it is for amplitude. So as we step closer and closer to the real world, the flat space is much closer to the real world, right? Now this, this, here we're talking about things that actually experimentalists measure and talk about, but the world is even cosmological. Okay, so it's not even flat space. And as we get closer and closer to the real world. Um, the magnitude of the sort of challenge of figuring out what this, uh, what, what the theory of these, this ab initio theory of these observables should be gets larger and larger. And I, I think we likely have to be sort of more and more imaginative in uh, seeing it. Okay, so now let me tell you what I'll be talking about in the lectures and we'll just start jumping into it. So, um, in the context of uh, scattering amplitudes, uh, the sort of first example of uh, the first sort of working example of this kind of structure uh, was for n equals four super Yang mills and the story of the amplitohedron. Now I will not be talking about the amplitohedron directly in these lectures. Um, <clears throat> Instead, what I'll start off talking about is a much simpler amplitohedron <laughs> for a much simpler theory. Uh, which is the bicolored, you'll see what these words mean in a second, or biadjoint phi cube theory. Where the epithedron for this theory are known as uh, associahedra. So these are geometric shapes, in fact, just polytopes. There are some pictures of them up there. I'll tell you what they mean uh, in uh, 20 minutes. Uh, sociohedra and their generalizations. Okay, but so what we're going to do is we're going to just think about the simplest, dumbest theory of amplitudes to begin with, of just uh, tree scattering for scalar particles where only some planar diagrams. Okay, tree diagrams for uh, phi cube theory. Okay, and we're going to take this attitude towards it. The space is just going to be the space of Mandelstam invariants. Okay? That's all these things depend on. There's no polarization vectors, nothing else. They only depend on Mandelstam invariance. Our canvas is going to be the space of Mandelstam invariance, and we've got to stare at it. What the hell am I supposed to do with a bunch of pi dot pjs? What question should I ask in the space of pi dot pjs, whose answer is going to be the amplitudes for the phi cube theory? Okay, that's the question that we're going to uh, we're going to examine. And actually, in the rest of this lecture, I'll give you evidence for why there is something there, why there is something to be, to be understood. Very qualitative, simple things uh, to be understood. Okay, so I'll spend a couple of lectures talking about uh, 
uh, talking about uh, this. As you'll see, uh, this underpins the singularity structure for tree scattering amplitudes. And in fact, the, the story extends at, at loop level, but I'll probably just uh, uh, say only a little bit about one loop if I get there. Um, this, uh, this gives a sort of a, a universal understanding for the singularity structure for any amplitude in any number of dimensions. Okay? That's that simply because the kind of singularity structure of phi cubed graphs is the structure of denominators for every theory. Okay? And so you'll see there's there's interesting notion of a positive geometry that controls that. Uh, controls that. Um, in the last couple of lectures, I'm going to switch gears to a different topic. Um, here we're going to talk about positivity constraints in effective field theory. So we're just going to imagine something simple like two to two scattering amplitudes. As Guy was uh, reminding you, I'm just being uh, loose for the moment, um, uh, higher dimension operators, effective ultraviolet physics that we don't know, is uh, encoded in this two to two scattering amplitude by a bunch of contact interactions. Things that look like the sum of APQ, S to the P, T to the Q. Now, from the 1960s implicitly, and around 15 years ago, slightly more explicitly, uh, we've known that there are some somewhat surprising, perhaps, constraints on the coefficients of these higher dimension operators following from unitarity and causality of, of, uh, of, of the high energy theory. And there's an ultraviolet avatar of this. You can derive it from dispersion relations. There's an infrared avatar uh, from asking that you can't, uh, si uh, you can't uh, send signals faster than the speed of light in general backgrounds. OK, but, but there are certain positivity conditions on these. Uh, there are certain positivity conditions on these objects, on these coefficients. Um, but with all of this new appearance of the notion of positivity that I will be reviewing for you, we're actually going to see that that story from 15 years ago was actually the tip of a really, really big iceberg, that these coefficients actually lie inside a certain geometric space. We call the EFT hedron. And in fact, the, the conditions that determine the EFT hedron are extremely close to the amplitude hedron. They're not identical, but we'll see very similar ideas showing up. And in fact, it'll be an excuse for, for me to tell you something about the amplitude without telling you anything about the amplitude. <laughs> okay, so you'll learn a lot about the things that go into thinking about the amplitude already in this setting, which is telling you something un universal about the structure of uh, higher dimension operators for any theory, um, because there is vastly more positive structure following from locality and unitarity than met the eye to a begin with. So this is this turns out to be and this is this is not obvious that that they're this turns out to be very very similar to the amplitahedron. In fact, it's kind of a baby version of the uh, of the uh, amplitahedron in some ways. Okay, so those are the those are the two subjects that I want to talk about in these lectures. I haven't said anything yet, so I presume there are no questions. But if there are questions about vacuous nonsense, this is the time for it. No? Good, you have excellent taste. Good. <laughs> OK. So let's begin, with, uh, let's begin with the first subject. Um, as I said, uh, I probably won't have time to do this. If people are interested, maybe a late night session on Thursday, um, if I don't get there. Uh, there will also be some fantasies about how these pictures might be might potentially give you a new angle on thinking about the hierarchy problem and, and, and fine, fine tuning problems in general. It's, if it sounds crazy, that's why it's, it's appropriate for a late night session. Okay? Uh, um, but uh, what we're going to be seeing in the next couple lectures, just in this dumb old phi cube theory, are 
hidden symmetries in a non-supersymmetric bosonic theory. Okay, so if nothing else, that should give you some, some reason uh, to think that there might be something simple that we're missing, uh, even, about, uh, even about the Higgs or the, or the CC. Okay, but um, so let's start with the, with the uh, first topic, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, the positive geometry, and we'll understand what this word means in a bit of the phi cubed planar theory, by adjoint theory. Okay, so let me, let's set up the question again. The question we're asking, uh, imagine that we just have these scalar particles, they're being shot in. The experimentalist doesn't know that there's a space-time on the inside and Feynman rules and all the rest of it. They just throw the particles in in the morning, they measure them at night, right? Um, and they see some patterns in these, in these objects that, uh, that, that we as theorists integrate in the inside of the space-time, the Hilbert space, and the path integral, and all the rest of it in order to uh, give rise to an explanation. And so, really what we want to do is put something else in that question mark, right? We want to find a different machine that's going to give us uh, the same answer without talking about, uh, without talking about evolution through space-time. And I'm now going to give you some indications of why such, such a thing might exist, some super simple qualitative indications for why such a thing should uh, exist. All right? So, but just, just to begin with, to be definite, let's, uh, let's cheat and look inside the box here and see what the theory is, okay, in conventional language. So the theory that we're talking about is, uh, uh, at, we're just going to be dealing at, at, at uh, tree level for now, and just going to be planar tree diagrams. So in other words, the particles are going to be ordered 1 through n, and we're just going to draw planar diagrams in that ordering. Okay? So that means that four points, I would draw 1, 2, 3, 4, the S and the T channel, but not the U channel. Okay? Because that would involve, that would involve uh, a crossing. At five points, I would have At five points, I would have the same thing, one, two, three, four, five. I could cycle the indices around, okay? Um, at six points, I could have things that, again, look like this, one, two, three, four, five, six. I could also have new-looking diagrams, like this Mercedes-Benz diagram, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, okay? Is it clear what we're doing? We're just drawing tree diagrams with an ordering for the external particles. That's practically what we're doing. Now, how do I justify this from a Lagrangian? Um, this is a Lagrangian for, uh, you're, you're used to the fact that you get planar diagrams when you do color ordering. Are, how many people are familiar with the idea of color ordering? All right, so let me explain this if you haven't seen it. So. Ordinarily, when you have a Yang-Mills theory, you would draw diagrams, maybe something like this, and then you'd have color factors. So maybe you'd write something like F, A1, A2, E, F, E, A3, D, F, G, A5, A4, right? Just write down a bunch of these FABCs contracted with each other in this, uh, in this, in this way. Oh, sorry. These are all. Okay, so this is D, D, E, E. Okay. Okay, but you can use the fact that FABC is the trace of the commutator of TA, TB, and TC. You can use that to write any such tree diagram, in fact, as a sum over traces, like trace TA1, TA2, TA3, TA4, let's say, I'm doing at four points, multiplied by some function of P1, P2, P3, P4, plus trace 
and another ordering, TA1, TA3, TA2, TA4. Times, so this would be the ordering 1, 2, 3, 4, because that's the ordering in which the indices show up in that trace. You can have another one where the indices were, where they're ordered in a different way, and this would be that ordering, 1, 3, 2, 4, P1, P4, and so on. Okay, in this case, there are three orderings that you could write down. And in general, there are n minus 1 factorial over 2 different orderings that you can write down. Okay, why is it n minus 1 factorial? Because the traces are cyclically invariant, and they're also the same forwards and backwards. So it's n minus 1 factorial over 2 different color orderings that, uh, that you can have. And this is useful because each one of these pieces has simpler Feynman rules. Each one of these pieces, you just draw planar diagrams in that ordering. So here you draw 1, 2, 3, 4 on the boundary on the outside, ordered, and you just draw planar diagrams in that ordering, and then you draw the same diagrams for the other guys. Okay, so that's the notion of color ordering. If you haven't done it, it's a very simple exercise to show how you go from these expressions to these ones. Okay? All right, now, um, so what are we doing in the scalar theory? Why is it called the bicolored, biadjoint scalar theory? Well, because I want to have some excuse to draw these planar diagrams. And so the Lagrangian should be something like FABC, phi A, phi B, phi C. But that has a problem. It's equal to zero because FABC is totally anti-symmetric. Okay, so uh, what you do is you give it a second set of colors. Okay? And now we're just doing the Feynman rules for this theory. Okay, we're just doing the Feynman rules for this theory. But what you get from here is a trace of some orderings in these variables and some orderings in the other one. So if in, in one, one given ordering, sigma 1 through sigma n, and another ordering, sigma prime 1, a1, uh, sigma prime n, a n. Okay, so we can have different ordering for one factor and for, for one color factor and for the other color factor. And a very pretty thing you can easily work out is which diagrams contribute to these double color orderings, those planar diagrams that are planar with respect to both orderings. Okay, in particular, if we choose the orderings, if we choose that piece of the color trace where this ordering is the same as that ordering, then it's just all planar diagrams. But you could choose the orderings to be different, and a subset of the planar diagrams will be the same, like, like an obvious thing. Let's say you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to 100. Versus 2, 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to 100. They're mostly the same at the end. Only a few of the diagrams um, are going to be ordered uh, differently, will be missing from one relative to the other. Okay? So, um, but if the orderings are identical, then every, every diagram that's planar uh, will contribute to that double color ordering. Okay? If, you weren't, if you're not paying attention to this, it's not very important because this is just to give you a Lagrangian justification for just drawing planar diagrams. <laughs> the very, very simplest uh, diagrams we can. Okay? These things won't be restricted to planarity ultimately, but it's simplest to begin life with things that are restricted to uh, planarity. Okay? So, so just to be concrete, what are we talking about? At four points, we're talking at, at n equals four points, uh, our tree amplitude here, one, two, three, four, would just be the S channel plus the T channel. Okay, so this would be g squared, 1 over p1 plus p2 squared. Plus 1 over p2 plus p3 squared. Set. From now on, I'm not going to keep putting the, uh, uh, the, the powers of g. Okay, so I'll just, I'll, I'll leave that implicit. Okay, so we'd write this as 1 over s plus 1 over t, for example and more. Uh, 
Okay, and at five points, we already, again, we talked about it. These are the only diagrams. One, two, three, four, five. So this would be one over P1 plus P2 squared, P1 plus P2 plus P3 squared, plus the cyclic shifts. Okay, so we'd have a total of five terms in this case. At six points, actually we have a total of 14 terms. And they each look like one over propagator, propagator, propagator. There's three poles. Okay. So like, like this one, for example. But they all have three sets of propagators of different sorts. OK? So that's secretly what's going on. The experimentalist doesn't know. We know that what's going on, they have n particles. They have their finger on the Mandelstam dial. They can move the Mandelstams around. And secretly what's going on in the black box is they're summing three planar diagrams. OK? But we're now going to pretend that we don't know that. We're going to put ourselves in the, in the mindset of this experimentalist. We don't know that. All we have access to is the answer. And we want to see, how could we find a theory for what's going on? Okay. Okay, so to begin with, um, I just want to introduce a little bit of notation that's going to make our life uh, easier for the rest of these, for the rest of this discussion. Um, So some notation and, and good kinematical variables. So um, first, let's think about what are the obvious kinematical invariants. There are the Mandelstam variables. Uh, pi dot pj. Okay. So if ij runs from 1 to n for n particle scattering, I have pi dot pj. How many pi dot pj? So let's just first count how many, how many invariants there are. Well, there are n choose two of these variables. Because we're, we're assuming that the particles are massless. It doesn't actually matter. They can be massive. But let, just for simplicity, uh, let's just say uh, that, that these guys are uh, massive. But of course, there's momentum conservation, right? Momentum conservation says that the sum of pj mu equals 0, which implies that the sum over j of pi dot pj is equal to 0, right? So there's n choose 2 minus n constraints from momentum conservation. So the number of independent Mandelstam variables is n choose 2 minus n. And right away, this is slightly annoying, right? How am I going to choose how to? which of these pi dot pjs I'm going to choose, right? I could choose to solve for pn in terms of negative p1, negative p2, up to negative pn minus 1. That's breaking a symmetry between all the uh, particles and so on. OK, fortunately, there's something slightly nicer that we can do. Let's uh, actually go back and see what the amplitudes depended on. See, in these planar amplitudes, like if I draw a picture like this, what kind of propagators do I see? I see a propagator that looks like p1 plus p2 squared. From here, here I get something like p1 plus p2 plus p3 squared. Here, p1 plus p2 plus p3 plus p4. You see, it's just sums of consecutive p's. Right? 
So when you have planar diagrams, only the consecutive momenta show up in propagators. That's a little bit, that's a little bit more restricted. Notice it's still slightly annoying because uh, I, I could label this as P1 plus P2 squared, or equivalently as P3 plus P4 plus P5 plus P5 plus P6 squared, because I, I have momentum conservation, right? So I still don't, I still don't have quite a nice labeling for the same one and the same invariant. Okay. But there's actually a very beautiful and natural picture. So let's just try to uh, visualize momentum conservation. Momentum conservation means that I have a bunch, I have n, four, n uh, uh, vectors p mu. I'm not specifying the number of dimensions here. So th th I, be, I could be leaving it an arbitrary many number of dimensions. But I have n vectors mu, uh, n vectors pi, but they're ordered naturally, p1 through pn. So uh, the fact that momentum is conserved means that if I lay them end to end, they'll give me a closed polygon. That's momentum conservation. So this would be p1 mu, p2 mu, p3 mu, and so on. Okay. So that's cool, because now what are these planar propagators? These planar propagators that we see are the sums of consecutive momenta. So that would be like starting here at some i and be summing this plus this plus this plus this and going up to some j. Right? If you think about these vertices as having some coordinates, so that each p a mu is just x a plus 1 mu minus x a mu, right? Just like as we see in this picture, then I can naturally associate from an i to a j a variable x i j which in terms of the momenta is just pi plus dot dot plus pj minus 1 squared. OK, is that clear? So if I draw the momenta end to end on a d-dimensional piece of paper, I get a closed polygon. And now I just look at the distance between two points on this polygon, the squared distance. Okay, and all of those guys are all the propagators that show up in the picture. Notice that the distance between two adjacent guys is what? It's zero because p squared is equal to zero. Okay, so all the, all the edges of this polygon are null, okay, but the distance between non-adjacent guys is, are the variables that we see in the uh, propagators. Okay, now here's, here's a lovely thing. How many of these xij's are there? The number of xij's is also equal to n choose 2 minus n, right? It's exactly the number of independent Mandelstam variables, OK? So that's our kinematic space. Our kinematic space is the space of xij's. No, we still have this little thing that xij is equal to xji, of course. It only depends on this pair. Right? Furthermore, using the x's, uh, we actually get a very nice sort of geometric picture of what each Feynman diagram is. So let's go back to four-point scattering, where I had these two diagrams. This one is 1 over p1 plus p2 squared. This is 1 over p2 plus p3 squared. Now let's just practice writing these in terms of our new friends, our new, our, our new, uh, our new variables. So now I draw the square instead, 1, 2, 3, 4. So this would be p1, p2, p3, p4, right? So who is p1 plus p2 squared? Well, 
That's this guy. So that's 1 over x13. And what about this guy? The other one, right? p1, p2, p3, p4. This is 1 over x24. OK? Let's do our next example. So let's say we're at five points, and I do this guy. One, two, three, four, five. So this is 1 over p1 plus p2 squared, p1 plus p2 plus p3 squared. So let's, who is this? So here I have my pentagon, p1, p2, p3, p4, p5 with its edges. Right, so who is this first factor? 1 over p1 plus p2 squared. It's x13. And what about p1 plus p2 plus p3 squared? x14. Okay? Now, what do we notice in these examples? What is each Feynman diagram? Each Feynman diagram is a triangulation of the polygon. And in fact, that's not a coincidence, because this is a planar diagram, and the dual of this planar diagram is the triangulated polygon. Or we can go backwards. So you're used to the notion of a dual diagram, perhaps. If not, it's very simple. If I want to take the dual of this diagram, I put a point in the center of every face. There's also some sort of faces here, out here, externally. OK, and that's it. And then I, and then I join everything where the corresponding faces uh, meet. I join with an edge. So oh, this is a piece of shit. Sorry. So is that. <laughs> Let's see if we can do this. That's better. Is that clear? So the dual of a triangulation of a polygon is a planar Feynman diagram at tree level. How many people have seen this before? OK, good. Excellent. Yes? In Feynman diagram, it's very distinct when you say 1, just to go to 3 to 4. Yes. It's exactly the same thing. I mean, they're still labeled. The external legs are still labeled. So you have, uh, um, uh, oh, are you talking about the distinction between who is in and out? Oh, that's already gone even in Feynman diagrams, because I should have said this in the very beginning. I'm sorry. Um, we're doing what we normally do in books, which is to immediately assume that all the particles are outgoing. OK, so we're treating all the in and out on the same footing. That is a hugely non-trivial fact, that uh, the crossing symmetry of a quantum field theory is a hugely non-trivial fact. Um, and that's a very early indication that there is something more to the life of an amplitude than the matrix picture of in to out. You actually start off, the first thing you do is you continue all the momenta, so everyone's outgoing. That means it's completely lost the matrix interpretation at that point. <laughs> Okay, but anyway, we, we, uh, thank you for bringing it up. I should, have, I should have said that right from the start. So we're assuming that all the lines are incoming. Um, only then can I put all the legs of the polygon on an equal footing, right, without any uh, uh, spurious signs between them. Any other questions? OK, so now we have good variables. And we even, um, there are the basis for all the mandel salmon variants. And there's even a beautiful formula for the amplitude, right? So. Uh, so this is a kind of a target for what we're going to try to understand from some other point of view. But once again, the usual picture of Feynman diagrams um, would say that the tree amplitude in this theory, now translating into this language, is the sum over triangulations of the polygon, the product over all the chords in the triangulation of one all of the xij of the ij, which is a chord in the triangulation. Is that clear? OK. So 
So we peeked in the box. That's what's going on in the box, right? Now we're going to forget about it. And, um, and uh, um, go back to our experimentalist friend who's living at infinity. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> what I now want to tell you is uh, what, the, what the things are that you notice about this amplitude that would make you think there's something like a space-time and Feynman diagrams involved. And then tell you why there's something more some qualitative, simple, extra thing, which you haven't seen in any of your textbooks, which is uh, a, a hint for uh, something uh, more to understand, which will be related to those pictures, and ultimately to the notion of positive geometries that we're going to spend, uh, uh, spend time talking about. All right, but now, again, pretend we don't know this. You're an experimentalist. You have the finger on the Mandelstam dial. You're measuring the amplitude. There's a number of things that are counterfactual about this. First of all, the experimentalist measures the cross-section and not the amplitude. <laughs> Secondly, the experimentalist has their finger on the Mandelstam dial and imagining they can access all values in the Mandelstam invariant. Crucially, and this is, a, this is another topic for a lunch or dinner time conversation, this cannot be done in Minkowski space. This cannot be done in Lorentzian signature, 3 comma 1 signature. It's an, this is the fascinating fact, you spend some time thinking about this, even at four points. Even at four points, all we have is S and T variables. Maybe you, you want, you like U as well. You can have S plus T plus U equals zero. Okay? But you can ask, can you access all possible values of S, T, and U with S plus T plus U equals zero, where you write the S, T, and U as a dot product of momenta in Minkowski space? The answer is no. Okay? And in fact, for instance, if you have S plus T plus U is zero, it's, you could have either S positive and T and U negative, or S and T both positive and U negative. Only one of those two options can be realized with Minkowski momenta, the one where S is positive and T and U are both negative. So this is a very interesting fact, that Minkowski space doesn't even cover all of Mandelstam space, even all of real Mandelstam space. And topic for a lunchtime conversation, this is why the S-matrix program was doomed in the 1960s, ultimately. Okay, because the entire idea was that you should be able to reconstruct the amplitude from some knowledge of its analytic structure and branch cuts corresponding to physical processes in Minkowski space, which seems doomed when you can't even cover all of Mandelstam space with Minkowski momenta. Okay? This is one of many indications, dinner time conversation, <laughs> that if you're going to try to come up with a theory of the S matrix, you have to be more adventurous and get space and time out Causality in space and time are outputs. It cannot be sort of inputs that you responsibly put in the very beginning. Okay? Because if you do that, in ordinary Minkowski space, you can't even cover everything. You can ask, is there a signature that does let you cover all values of Mandelstam invariance? The answer is yes. It's 2 comma 2 signature. You have to, it has to be even more Lorentzian. <laughs> it has to be maximally symmetric between space and time. Have 2 space and 2 time. In general, in D dimensions, it has to be as split as possible. Okay, a split as possible lets you cover all the possible Mandelstam invariants. So those are my little caveats here. This is not really a real experimentalist that lives on the boundary of real Minkowski space. First, I'm letting them measure the amplitude and not the cross-section. More importantly, they have their finger on the Mandelstam dial, able to access all Mandelstam invariants, okay, which they cannot do in 3 comma 1 signature. Okay, but nonetheless, it's a good mental exercise to so just pretend you have the answer. All you have is the answer. And what feature of the answer gets you excited? What feature do you think you want to build a theory for? Uh, what, 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 what feature is the feature that's going to, uh, you're going to use as a clue for some underlying theory? OK. So what do you think you would notice? You're an experimentalist. You have your finger on the Mandelstam dial. What do you think you would notice? Anyone. This is not a trick, particularly a trick question. Yes? You're, you're, you're already too smart. Now, I'm going to make fun of these too smart experimentalists in a second, okay? So you just set yourself up for some brutalization. Uh, anyone want to say something dumber than that? Dumber is good, okay? So in my, my world, dumb is good. Clever is bad. You should do the dumbest thing you always can in physics first because it normally works. Uh, yes? There you go. That's a better, that's a better, you're a ringer, you know, that. that. OK, so well, that, that's what would happen, right? You move Mandelstam around, and you're excited when something blows up, right? 
OK, so that's the first thing you notice, is that the amplitude blows up somewhere. Okay. Amplitude blows up when what? When some sum of pi plus dot dot pj minus 1 squared goes to 0, or in terms of a new variables, when some xij goes to 0. Okay, so that's the first thing anyone notices, is that the amplitude blows up somewhere. Now, what you do next depends on what kind of experimentalist you are. Okay, and especially if you're a particle physicist, if you're a theorist, you should really make friends who are experimentalists, many of them. Uh, there'll be spies inside the experiments if anything exciting starts happening, amongst other things. Okay, so it's very important to have friends who are experimentalists, but uh, that's only a joke. That, uh, <laughs> kind of. That, uh, so imagine that, um, imagine that uh, uh, anyone who knows the experimental particle physicist knows that there's two types. There's experimentalists who really wish they were theorists, so they're closet theorists. And then there's real experimentalists who give a crap about theory, OK? And the hero of this story is going to be the second experimentalist, and for the reason it will become obvious. The first experimentalist was the first comment made by our friend back there, who we're going to make a lot of fun of in a moment, OK? But the first experimentalist, who is really a closet theorist, they see that something is blowing up, so they've taken complex analysis. They know there must be a pole. Pole, they're very excited there's a pole, OK? Very cool. So they even know a simple pole. They actually measure. They're very excited. They see that amplitude goes, goes like, as xij goes to 0, or in terms of the original momenta, as p but pj minus 1 squared, they notice that it goes like this. And then they, look, they make very detailed measurements of what it looks like in that neighborhood. They move all the other mantle sample around. They make very detailed measurements. And what do they discover? What is the amazing thing they discover? What, what multiplies this pole? There's a pattern in what multiplies the pole. And the pattern is factorization. Right? That's, uh, that, as you come close to this pole, you have this thing multiplied by the product of lower point amplitudes on one side and the other. Okay, where here is this particle i, i plus 1, j, and j plus 1 on this side. OK, so you notice that the amplitude factorizes it has a pole, and on the pole, it factorizes the product of two lower amplitudes. OK? You could say this in the language of the polygon, that if you have this polygon, and as some xij goes to 0, you get 1 over xij multiplied by the guy you got on the left times the one that you got on the right. OK? That's just the same thing, just uh, translating. OK, so, so they go to their Morion conference, and they're excited about factorization. That's what they jump up and down about. Surely that's the clue for what's really going on. And in the audience, there's a bunch of theorists. One of them is named Feynman. Okay? And Feynman takes this clue from the experimentalist and says, I know what's going on. It's Feynman diagrams, named after me that I just did. Right? That, uh, <laughs> because after all, that picture exactly explains this. Right? That picture, now in this picture, there's all sorts of crap in the middle that's not on shell particles, all the virtual particles. Right? All the stuff on the inside is not part of what the experimentalist measures. It's put in from the outside, from Feynman's head. <laughs> Um, but if you have this picture where you sum over all these diagrams, then it's manifest. Where are the poles? Well, just where, where, where all the xij goes to zero. And what happens on the poles? You factorize into the product of two lower amplitudes. OK? So if factorization is the star, what you're most obviously led to is Feynman diagrams. Now, in fact, that's only if you're Feynman. There is another theorist in the audience who's a mathematician. Name is Pierre Deligne. And Pierre sees something totally different. Pierre says, oh, I've seen this before. I've seen this structure where something factorizes into the product of two lower things uh, of its own sort. If you have n points in projective space, I won't describe this in detail. We'll be talking about projective space more later anyway. But if you have n points on P1, 
endpoints ordered on the boundary of a disk modulo the action of SL2 on the disk, then no matter how you plunk them down, they're ordered somehow. And as you move these things around, these points can collide. And as they collide, that's going to a sort of a boundary of this moduli space of points on the boundary of a disk. And it's a famous fact that this boundary factorizes in exactly the same way. Okay? So it factorizes into the product of two lower spaces of this sort. In other words, if factorization is the star, Feynman says what must be going on is Feynman. I've seen this before. What must be going on is Feynman diagrams. And this is a picture of particles in space-time. Deline has seen this before, too. Endpoints on the boundary of a disk. They have the property that as you go to the boundary, it factorizes into the product of two lower spaces of the same sort. And this is the underpinning of the string world sheet picture. If you've taken the string theory class, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If not, just take it as impressionistic uh, uh, for the moment. Um, the important point is that fa making factorization obvious, factorization is the star, making factorization obvious, is what's hardwired both into the picture of particle scattering, particles in space-time, or the string world sheet. These are the two pictures we've had for 50 years for thinking about what particle scattering is. Okay? Factorization is the star of the show. OK. All right, so is there anything left to be understood? Well, there is a little more. And in order to see what the little more is, and as we'll see, the little more is actually a lot more. In order to see uh, what else there is uh, to understand, I now want to imagine the hero of this story, who is a second kind of experimentalist who gives a crap about theory. Okay? The second kind of experimentalist doesn't even know what a simple pole is, never mind a residue, they don't know anything. right? What do you think they do? They see something blow up first. Everyone sees something blow up. The, the closet theorist experimentalist goes to this very detailed measurement, blah, blah, factorizes. What would some, someone lazier do? You're not allowed to, you're not the, someone else. Blowing up is cool, right? Yeah, exactly. See if it blows up again. After all, you, after all, you like uh, dialed the Mandel Sams around to a particular XIJ, poof, it blew up. Now keep it there and dial the other ones around and see if you can make it blow up more. That's a nice thing to do. And, OK, so what happens if you do this at four points? At four points, if you dial, let's say, s goes to 0, no matter what you do with t, it doesn't blow up more. OK? So it only blows up once, either when s goes to 0 or when t goes to 0. OK? Already for five points, the pattern is more interesting, though. Like, let's say s12 goes to 0. OK? If s12 goes to 0, uh, we know, again, secretly because we know where it's coming from, we know that it blows up. But if S12 goes to 0, it's blowing up, and I'll draw it in the language of ordinary Feynman diagrams, because there's some kind of factorization like this, right? Where 1 plus 2 squared goes to 0. Now, having done that, what else can I do? See, if I set uh, P1 plus P2 squared to 0, then there's still two more ways that I could make it blow up again. Right? I could take this four point and blow it up itself in two ways. So I could blow it up, for example, like this. That's one way of blowing that four point up. Or I can blow it up like this. OK, so that. Starting from here, there are actually two places that I can go. Or if I make a list of, if I, so if, if I make a list of the single poles that can blow up, the one poles are when I have p1 plus p2 squared goes to 0 and cyclic. But the two poles are when p1 plus p2 squared 
goes to zero, and let's say P1 plus P2 plus P3 squared goes to zero, and it's cyclic friends. Okay, so there's five sets of single poles, but if I want to see how many double poles I can have, they have to occur in those combinations. Okay. Yes? Sorry? Oh, th these are not different. I'm sorry. Okay, I, drew it, I drew it wrong. I should have put three and four together. Sorry. Um, thank you. So that's interesting. Like, there's a, there's a certain pattern that they, they come in. Like, if p1 plus p2 squared goes to 0, I can't have p2 plus p3 squared go to 0. OK? But I can have p1 plus p2 plus p3 squared go, go to 0. Uh, by the way, what is this in our language of uh, polygons? Well, it's sort of, it was built into the picture where we said that Feynman diagrams are triangulations. So if I start off life with just a pentagon, I'm allowed to have a single pole, anything I like, like that one. Okay? But now, which double poles am I allowed to have? Anything which doesn't cross that line. Okay? So I can have this one, I can have this one, but I can't have that one. And what is that inputting? That's exactly inputting the physics of locality in space-time. Right? The fact that we can have uh, exactly the crossed propagators are things that cannot be drawn as local pictures in space-time. All the things that can be drawn as local pictures in space-time give me these nested sums of momenta that you can interpret as triangulations of the polygon. Is that clear? OK, so there's something interesting deeply reflecting locality in space-time about the pattern in which the poles can appear together. And let's see how our experimentalist friend would want to present this experimental result at the conference. Well, they like drawing things in graphs. OK, so here's how they would sort of represent what they've discovered at five points, let's say. See, it's kind of cool that they can, they, can, uh, they can capture in this one picture all the pattern of single and double poles that they, that they found. At five points, completely coincidentally, it is a pentagon. In general, it will look like a more complicated shape. Completely coincidentally, in this case, it's a pentagon, but let's just stare at it in a second. What is this pentagon? You should think about the interior as being no poles at all. And then the boundaries, the edges, are when you have one pole. And now two edges meet at a vertex if I can send both of those poles to zero together to make a double pole. OK, so you see, it's slightly non-trivial that the pattern of allowed double poles and single poles can be represented as this geometric shape that's a pentagon. It seems a little trivial in this example, but it's still a little bit cool to see how it works. Okay? For example, it's not, so let's say I start here. This is the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 factorization, and the vertices are the two ways of breaking it up, breaking that, uh, that four point up into a two, two, two different ways. Okay? And you'll notice it's not totally trivial. It's not like this is a cyclic rotation of that. This actually goes up by two. Okay? This goes from here, plus two, plus two, plus two, plus two as I go around. So it's very slightly non-trivial non here, actually. OK? All right, now, what is the analog of this picture for n equals 4? Just that. Right? There's just one pole. So I just have an interval, nothing on the inside, no factorizations. I have one, the S channel on one side and the T channel on the other side. OK? All right, now, our experimental friend, um, they're kind of impressed that they managed to draw this picture. In other words, they managed to represent the pattern of poles with a picture. Does it continue? Let's see what happens if we go to n equals 6. Now, if there was any such picture, what would the dimensionality of the picture have to be? There are three sets of poles, right? We can have up to three poles. So if there's any picture, it would have to be a three-dimensional picture. 
Right? It's a one-dimensional picture for n equals 4, two-dimensional picture for n equals 5. It would have to be a three-dimensional picture for n equals 6. All right? And now probably our experimentalist's imagination would, would run out at this point to just uh, draw it. But in fact, it's possible. And here it is. It's a much fancier looking shape. This is called the associahedron. In general, for at n points, it's called the n-dimensional, or the n minus, well, if we have n particle scattering, it's an n minus three-dimensional uh, associahedron. I've only, I've only decorated the vertices here with the cubic Feynman diagrams, but you can, for yourself, go put the partial factorizations on the edges and the single poles on the faces. And the remarkable thing is that it's possible to decorate the entire picture so that this three-dimensional object is capturing the pattern of poles, single, double, and triple that can occur together. Isn't that amazing? Right. Now, this observation was made by uh, uh, the mathematician Jim Stasha for his PhD thesis in the 1960s. Okay. In fact, he basically asked this question, is it possible to realize triangulations of an n-gon as facets and partial triangulations as facets of, of some geometric shape? And he actually did it, and he, uh, uh, but he didn't realize it as a polytope. You see, this is something, uh, well, define polytopes a little more, but informally, it's just something that has flat edges, right? It's something you can cut out by inequalities. He actually had a curvy realization, even of this three-dimensional shape, and um, one of the members of his thesis committee brought a cardboard cutout of that three-dimensional shape as, as an example of what it looked like that you could actually realize it as a polytope. It wasn't until the 1980s that all the mathematicians understood explicitly how to realize these things, cut them out by inequalities in general. Okay, and, and there was a subject that was a curiosity from many points of view, but which has been developed from a number of other points of view a lot more intensively just over the last 10 or 15 years, as these polytopes and their generalizations uh, um, have, uh, have shown up in a whole variety of uh, other settings, some of which we'll uh, talk about. But what I want to stress is that this is some hidden fact, right? The combinatorics of which sets of poles can occur together, which is deeply rooted to locality in space-time, is polytopal. That's not an obvious fact. Let me actually stress what a non-obvious fact it is by trying to see how we might discover it, even if we didn't manage to draw this picture. This takes take, take some inspiration to draw this picture. Okay? How, how might we discover it? Well, our experimentalist friend might not have the imagination to draw this 3D shape, but they could go and just count how many single poles, double poles, and triple poles are there at n equals 6. Okay? They could just move the mantle stem around, just record all the ones they got, and they would find there's 9, 21, and 14 of these guys. Okay, now, let's say you... Let's say you just want to see, is it even conceivable that there is a shape that has nine faces, 21 edges, and 14 vertices? And that kind of looks like a ball. What would you do to check to see if it even has a prayer? You would compute the Euler characteristic. Okay? Because if it did work, then V minus E plus F would have to equal 2. Okay, well, 9 minus 21 plus 14 equals 2. So that's why it has a chance of working. Now you do the same exercise. At n equals 7, you just count how many of them there are. This is the same as counting the number of single, double, triple, and quadruple triangulations of a heptagon. And these are the numbers you get, 14, 56, 84, 42. Compute the, alter the alternating sum of them, you get 0, which is the correct Euler characteristic for... Uh, for a four-dimensional object. You can be the alternating sum of these things, you get two. You're supposed to get alternate between zero and two in, in odd and even dimensions. So the fact that these things can be realized as the facet structure of a polytope implies some remarkable sum rule on the number of these, uh, on the number of these factorization channels. Is it easy to prove that sum rule directly? No, it is not. 
You can build a generating function that like computes all of them. It's some hypergeometric function. It's some funny hypergeometric identity that this Euler sum is zero. So I'm trying to stress from many points of view, this is not a trivial fact that the, that the combinatorics of the allowed factorizations is polytopal. OK? Now, you say, oh, cool. Well, experimentalist number one notices factorization. Lazy experimentalist number two notices this cool fact that it's polytopal. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. No. This thing knows everything. Okay? This thing also knows about factorization. Why does it know about factorization? Well, factorization, and we'll see this in more detail uh, later, but I just want to give you a, a, a first flavor of it. Uh, factorization corresponds to what the facets of this thing look like. That makes sense, right? Because the facets, a single face is when one pole turns on. So I want to see what does it look like when I, when I send a single, uh, when I take a single pole, that's like what does the face look like? All right, now let's look at this guy. It has six faces that looks like pentagons. See, one, two, three, four, five, six in the bottom of the back. Has six faces that look like pentagons, and three faces that look like squares. Here's a square, here's a square, there's a square. Okay. Now let's think about the factorization channels. There are six factorization channels that look like five particle on one side and three particle on the other. What did the five particle amplitude look like? A pentagon. Okay. Three particle is nothing, just one. So we get six factorizations that look like five point times three point. Now we have three factorizations that look like a four particle on one side and a four particle on the other, like one, two, three, four, five, six, and rotating over, right? We only have three, not six of them, because when you rotate three times, you come back to the same thing. Okay? All right, now what does the four particle look like? An interval. What does the other four particle look like? An interval. What is a direct product of two intervals? A square. OK? So you see, this shape knows about factorization, too. And it knows about it because the boundary structure is such that the facets look like products of lower objects of the same type, in precisely the way that reflects factorization as we expect to see it for amplitudes. OK? Now, this is an interesting fact. Feynman doesn't know this. Deline doesn't know this. Peskin and Schroeder doesn't know this. Sorry, that shows my age. Schwartz doesn't know this, right? That, uh, all right? Who, whichever field theory book you're using now, right? Um, OK, this is a basic fact about the structure of poles which is not obvious in any of our usual ways of talking about uh, amplitudes, and knows more, right? Knows, uh, so there's an object that's both polytopal and which, um, and which uh, factorizes on its boundaries to explain factorization. So our goal in the next lecture is going to be to explain where this comes from, okay, to give an understanding for where this comes from. So this was just sort of motivation to show you there's something to understand and there's something that involves geometric and combinatorial ideas. And I, I hope it's clear what, uh, where, uh, what, the, uh, what both of those, how, how both of those words are being sort of practically used in this, uh, in this uh, setting. Um, but uh, in the remaining time that I have, I want to tell you one more feature. Uh, which is very closely related to this and which will also uh, uh, motivate the idea of canonical forms. And next time we'll be much more systematic in talking about these things. This is really just to give you a taste for some of the things involved. All of these things, this picture is actually related to a hidden symmetry. But in order to see what the hidden symmetry is, 
we have to slightly upgrade our notion of what the amplitude is. <laughs> okay. And again, this will be, we'll, we'll be seeing this in action much more uh, explicitly next time. But let me just show you what is involved already in our simplest cases. So let's go back to the four point. Let's go back to the four point amplitude. Okay, and once again, ordinarily, we think about the amplitude as just the sum of these two terms. 1 over s plus 1 over t. Or I could use the x variables if I like. So this is the function. Now, what's special about 1 over z? It has a simple pole. Let's go back to being theorists, right? So it has a simple pole, it has a residue at z equals 0, Cauchy's theorem, blah, 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 right? But strictly speaking, if you want to talk about a residue, you're not talking about the function 1 over z. That doesn't mean anything. You can change what z goes as 1 over z. You can change what it looks like by making uh, coordinate transformations. What we're really talking about is the differential form dz over z. See, it's dz over z that kind of has the singularity at z equals 0, and you can detect it by doing a little contour integral around z equals 0. Okay? So somehow more canonical than the function 1 over z is the form dz over z. And we'll be seeing this a lot. Okay, we'll be, we're going to be playing with these forms. We'll call them canonical forms. We'll be doing a lot with them. But, uh, but already here at the most basic level, um, I want to, instead of thinking about a function, I want to think about, think about a form instead. Now, ultimately, we want the function. I'll tell you how to get the function. Okay, but we're going to think about a form instead. And what is the form going to be? Well, what do you think, what do you think the form would be? What's the dumbest thing the form could be? It's going to be a form that lives on st space, right? Those are our, our variables. So it's going to be ds over s plus dt over t, right? That's the dumbest thing that, that, that it could be. OK? All right, but in fact, we're going to want to do that instead. Let me try to explain why. You see, let's say I have ds over s plus dt over t. And then I might want to write this as d log of s plus d log t. All right, but this is. This doesn't really make sense, because s has units, right? So this is ds over some mu squared, maybe, plus d log t over some mu squared. But then there's this annoying dependence on mu squared. What I would really like is for the form to only depend on the ratios of s over t. OK? And that's just patently false if I put a plus sign there. But if I put a minus sign, if I put d log s minus d log t, well, this is just d log s over t. And that's only a function of s over t. OK? We can actually say this a little bit more invariantly, sort of heavy-handedly in this case, that I have a form. And I want it to be defined, since I, want it to be, since I want it to be only a function of the ratios, I want it to be so-called projectively invariant. In other words, if I have an omega that depends on s and t, I want it to be exactly the same as an omega that depends on any 
local rescaling, alpha of S and T times S and T. Alpha can be S and T dependent, right? Because the point is it's only dependent on the, the ratios. So I should be able to do any local transformation I like. And let's see what happens. If I, if I take D log of S under, and I send S to alpha, which can depend on S and T, S, and T goes to alpha of S and T, T, then, then D log S goes to D log S plus D log alpha, and D log T goes to D log T plus D log alpha. And so I want the log alpha to cancel, right? I want it to be invariant under this shift, so I can only take the combination D log S minus D log T is invariant. Only this is invariant under this local rescaling of all the Mandelstam variables. OK? And so there's this sort of interesting form. It's always a kind of an amusing thing. ST space is two dimensional. So here is S and T. ST space is two dimensional. But I found a one form on this space, which is ds over s minus dt over t. Okay. And now there's the final question. How from this one form can I extract the amplitude, the actual amplitude, 1 over s plus 1 over t? Well, it's a, it's a form. It's a one form in an ambient two-dimensional space. So what do you normally do when you have a form of a low dimension that lives in some high-dimensional space? You have to find some surface of the right dimensionality, and you sort of pull back the form to that space to see what it looks like on that space. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. And I'll explain more next time where these things come from, but I'm just giving you a uh, uh, an idea of the uh, sorts of things we're, we're, we're going to see. There's going to be a certain subspace, one-dimensional subspace. In this case, just given by s plus t equals constant. So that's just that line. And you'll notice, and I've drawn it so that this constant is uh, positive. So you'll notice that this looks like First of all, on this line, I have a little interval here. On one end, s is 0. On the other end, t is 0. And furthermore, if I take omega and I pull it back to the space where s plus t equals constant, what do I get? Well, it's ds over s minus dt over t. But ds plus dt equals 0. So this becomes ds times 1 over s plus 1 over t. Okay, and that 1 over s plus 1 over t is the amplitude. So we have this interesting form, lives everywhere in this space. But we found an interesting subspace to pull it back to. On that one-dimensional subspace, this one form has Singularities in two spots when s goes when t goes to zero and when s goes to zero. And in fact, if you just pull off the volume form on this subspace, what it multiplies is the actual amplitude. Okay. Now we're going to be generalizing all of that. We're going to find a form, and in fact, this is going to be this is going to determine. The amplitude. That there's a form that lives on the space of all the Mandelstams. Tuck. It's fixed by a requirement that there is a certain subspace. When you pull it back to that subspace, you will discover on the subspace an isosahedron. 
And we'll see where they come from. Very natural questions where you ask a natural, we're not putting in anything that looks like that to begin with. We're going to ask a natural question in the kinematic space. But we'll discover on a subspace the isosahedron. And the scattering form is the form that has the property that it has singularities on and only on the boundaries of that isosahedron. That notion of a form with singularities on the boundaries of some geometric object, that's the idea of a positive geometry and its corresponding canonical form. The word positive is going to make more sense when we talk about the description of the interior of anything. Okay? So when we talk about the interiors of, you know, when you want to be uh, on the, in the interior of the positive, uh, in the interior of the quadrant, you say that x is positive and y is positive. Very generally, being in the interior of any region is associated with the notion of positivity. And, uh, and so uh, all of these interesting geometric objects have a natural notion of positivity that goes along with them. More non-trivially, they're associated with certain differential forms that only have singularities on their boundaries. And that's what the amplitudes will end up being. The amplitude will end up being the objects that uh, only have singularities on their boundaries. So, so two things have to happen. We have to find some question to ask in kinematic space that brings these remarkable objects to life. And then we have to understand what the form is, if any, but why is there a form? What is a form that has singularities on the boundaries of this space? Okay, but, but, it's, but it very much has to do with this uh, 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 hidden symmetry. Now, let me just, uh, just in five minutes and I'll end. Um, what this, uh, here it didn't seem very impressive. Here it seemed like, here it seemed like uh, I wanted it to be projective, I chose a sign, and I made it projective. Okay? But now let's go on to n equals five. All right? And you'll see what the issue is. So let me revert now to the let me revert to the to, to the x notation. So what are the terms that I could have? Well, if I want the form, it should be like d log dx13 over x13, dx14 over x14, and then plus or minus. I don't know what the signs are. All the cyclic ones. Okay, so there are five terms. Okay, so notice there are five terms, but only four relative signs that I could talk about, right? Because the overall sign does not matter. So I have four relative signs. At my disposal. Now, let me ask if it's possible to make this projectively invariant. So once again, I have to take x13, x24, x35, x14, x25. These are my five variables. And shift them by alpha times the same. OK? Where, where alpha can depend on all the x's. So let's see what happens when I do this to this first term. So what's the variation of the first term under that shift? Okay, so it goes into d log x13 plus d log alpha, d log x14 plus d log alpha. Now, d log alpha, wedge d log alpha is 0. Good. But, so this is d log x13, d log x14. But now, you see, I have plus d log alpha times d log x14. And then uh, plus d log x13, d log alpha. And I have something similar to that for all the other five terms. Now, in order for this to be invariant, the, the coefficient of d log alpha has got to vanish. 
Okay, but notice the coefficient of d log alpha, there are five different things that I could have in front of it. d log alpha, d log x13, x24, x35, all five of them. So you notice this is not obviously guaranteed by equations and unknowns, because five things have to vanish, but I only have four signs at my disposal. Okay? So this is not guaranteed to work by equations and unknowns. But it does work. Remarkably, it works. Okay? In fact, in this simple case, it's literally with all plus signs cycling. Works. That's just a very simple case here. But it's not guaranteed by equations and unknowns. Let's say you go up to n equals 6. Now the number of sign patterns at your disposal, how many sign patterns at our disposal? We have 14 terms. 13 sign patterns, okay? Uh, and you can check. There are many more than that <laughs> things that have to cancel. And the discrepancy just grows and grows and grows as we go to higher and higher points, okay? It is totally non-trivial that it's possible to choose these signs in order for the answer to be projectively invariant. Now, as we'll see, so that is a hidden symmetry of this form. It is possible. It's not trivial. It's not guaranteed. In fact, the signs are given to you by the polytope, and we'll talk about that next time. All of this is guaranteed by the presence of the polytope. Uh, but this is saying this is more than just something cool and pretty looking. There's even a symmetry that the answer has that is not seen um, is invisible term by term in the Feynman diagrams. Notice every Feynman diagram by itself is not invariant, right? That's the point. D log S, not invariant by itself. D log, D log of these guys, not invariant by themselves. If you only care about the function, path integral Feynman diagram, you just add them all up. You don't know there's this one, there's that one, there's that one. You just add them all up together with all plus signs. But this upgraded form is a, is a more sophisticated gadget. They come together with signs, as we'll see, the reason it becomes projective is that they're gluing together these individual Feynman diagrams are vertices of something, okay? And the fact that they're vertices of something, uh, they're gluing together into a polytope is what guarantees this uh, projective invariance. And this has consequences for the amplitude. As we'll see, once we have this basic idea of positive geometries and canonical forms, once we have the geometry, we just have to get the canonical form for it somehow. We have somehow have to find a form with logarithmic sing with, with these singularities on all the boundaries of the space. Sometimes the polytopes have a property of technically known as simple, which we'll, we'll talk about, which means that you can write down the forms simply by taking every vertex of the polygon and wedging together all the variables associated with the faces that vanish on the uh, associated with the faces that meet at that vertex. Okay. In some cases, uh, uh, there's a broad class of polytopes where you can work out this canonical form in that way. When applied to the isosahedron, that method is known as Feynman diagrams. So Feynman diagrams are one particular triangulation of the isosahedron. They break many symmetries. They don't make the projective invariance manifest. They have all sorts of other features that they don't make manifest. And then there are many other triangulations of the isosahedron that don't correspond to Feynman diagrams, and which remarkably, even from this dumb old phi cube theory, are faster, they're more efficient, <laughs> smaller formulas. You can get them on your computer much, much faster than just summing up all of the stupid old phi cube diagrams. Okay, so anyway, that's all for sort of uh, broad motivation today. Starting next time, we'll really dig into the details. So really, my, my goal for these lectures is for you to really be able to know enough about a small enough part of the subject that if you wanted to, you could work on it, okay? Because there's uh, one of the great things about this business, it requires essentially no background, only ability, okay? <laughs> it requires essentially no background, just some adventurous spirit, and, uh, uh, and it's ideal even for like undergraduates or people who want to play, okay? Um, uh, but there's a little bit of initial hump 
there's a little bit of initial hump from some slightly unfamiliar concepts, and that's what I'll, I want to uh, concretely go through with you. Okay, so the, really this lecture was mostly motivation so that you'll be willing to you know, slog through some projective geometry and some canonical formology and so on and so forth in order to be able to play with these things. But what, what have we seen? I hope you've seen there's something qualitative about the, something as basic as the pole structure of good old-fashioned phi cube theory. Again, this structure for the poles of the amplitude is universal for any theory in any number of dimensions. Anything has these cubic singularities, right? And there's this interesting polytopal structure to the combinatorics that knows even more than factorization, and it exposes hidden symmetries that we didn't know about before. And we're going to learn where all of these things come from uh, next lecture and the lecture after that, going back to kinematical space, just the stupid space of xij's. And we're going to ask some funny question in this space that will start bringing these objects to life. Okay, thanks a lot.